Hey Sudeesh, and good morning. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of the National School of India University, Mangalore, I welcome all of the distinguished guests and who are here with us in person and joining us online to the inaugural Justice E.S. Venkatramaya Memorial Lecture. We are gathered here today due to the generous support and tireless efforts of Justice ESV's family, his daughter, Honorable Justice B.V. Nagratna, and his granddaughter, Advocate Nayanathara. Personally, their efforts to advance the National Law School's interests in contributing to the public understanding of law and the Constitution. Honorable Dr. Justice Chandrachud, Chief Justice of India, and the Chancellor of the National Law School has kindly agreed to deliver this inaugural lecture on the centennial year of Justice ESV's birth. We look forward to hearing you, sir, and your, and your views on the theme of constitutional imperatives, a topic that was close to Justice ESV's professional and personal convictions. Justice ESV has a special connection to Bangalore, Karnataka, and the National Law School of India, and we are proud to be a host of this lecture. As a part of this welcome address, I will go over a few brief observations on an illustrious career. Scar and a very good morning to everybody. <laughs> Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Dr. Dhananjaya Yashwan Chandratud, fondly called as Dhan by his parents, Ms. Kalpana Das in absentia, my distinguished colleagues of the Supreme Court of India, Honorable Governor of Andhra Pradesh, Justice Abdul Nazir, Honorable Sri Justice Prasanna B. Varle, Chief Justice High Court of Karnataka, and Honorable Chief Justices of Calcutta High Court and Himachal Pradesh High Court, Honorable Judges of the High Court of Karnataka and other High Courts, Honorable Chief Justices of various High Courts who are in absentia, former Chief Justices and Judges of the Supreme Court and High Court of Karnataka, Chairman and members of the Bar Council of India as well as Karnataka, President and Office Bearers of Advocates Association, Bengaluru, Dharwad, Kalburgi, Supreme Court Bar Association, and as well as the Office Bearers of Supreme Court Advocates on Associ Record Association, Learned Principal District Judges and Judicial Officers from Karnataka and former Judicial Officers, Learned Senior Advocates from Karnataka, Delhi and elsewhere, members of all councils of National Law School, Vice Chancellor, Registrar and Faculty, past and present of NLS, Vice Chancellor of Bangalore City University, learned deans and faculty from various law colleges, distinguished invitees and guests, relatives, friends and associates of Justice E.S. Venkatramaya, dear students, members of the press and electronic media, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I apologize for the lack of space, but I am overwhelmed with all your presence. I must express my gratitude to Honorable Chief Justice of India, Dr. D.Y. Chandrachur, who is also the Chancellor of the National Law School of India University, for so readily and very graciously accepting our invitation to deliver the inaugural Justice E.S. Venkatramaya Centennial Memorial Lecture here at Bengaluru. I thank each one of you present here today and online for having taken time off on a mid-December morning to reminisce and pay tribute to Justice Venkatramaya, whose hundredth birthday is tomorrow. I thank the National Law School of India University for having accepted an endowment and a lecture series in the name of my revered father. NLS is close to me in three different roles as a daughter of a teacher who taught there, a proud parent of an alumnus, and now as a part of the Executive Council. I have seen NLS from the days when the classes were being held in the Central College campus. In fact, Justice Santosh Hegde, then Advocate General for the State of Karnataka, my father who was here in summer vacation, and myself as a young advocate, sat in the first class of the NLS in 
first week of July 1988. It is a matter of pride not just for Karnataka, but for the whole of India that NLS has produced fine legal minds who have ex excelled nationally and internationally. I have the pleasant duty of introducing the distinguished speaker, Dr. D.Y. Chandrachud, Honorable the Chief Justice of India. Dr. Chandrachud has created history as being the first Chief Justice of India, emulating his revered father, Justice Yashwant Vishnu Chandrachud, who had also created history for having the longest tenure as the Chief Justice of India. We are all well aware of the unique appeal that his lordship enjoys in the legal corridors and beyond. It is as much for his unfailing politeness and unmatchable sagacity as for his ability to empathize with human suffering, give law a human face, and his unflinching commitment to safeguarding the basic tenets of our Constitution. Interestingly, Justice Chandrachud almost did not turn to law and would have instead made a career in economics. Having studied and expectedly performed exceedingly well in the economics honors course at the St. Stephen's College in Delhi, I still remember his mother especially telling all of us how he stood first in the class. He was, a, he was to pursue a master's from the Delhi School of Economics. Writing about his Delhi University days in an essay titled, A Tryst with Economics and Law, Justice Chandrachud has shared that having enrolled in the master's in economic course, since classes were due to start in a few weeks, he began attending lectures at the campus law center, Delhi University. The intertwined, intertwined questions of policy and constitutional morality with the quest for liberty and freedom that arose during those lectures led him to make the career-altering choice of pursuing LLB degree. I must say that our nation has been a beneficiary of that choice. I would not be wrong in saying that the field of economics and commerce has not suffered a loss either, for his lordship has made phenomenal contribution to commercial law jurisprudence through his judgments on insolvency law, debt recovery, corporate law, and financial regulation. Justice Chandrachud went on to pursue a master's in law, having been granted the prestigious INLAC scholarship, and also read for a doctorate in judicial sciences at Harvard University, Massachusetts. However, foreign education did not take away the pulse of Indian society from his lordship's heart. On completing his studies, he enrolled as an advocate with the Bar Council of Maharashtra, and began his career as an advocate, practicing in Bombay High Court and the Supreme Court. He was, the, all, he was amongst the youngest to be designated senior advocate at the age of 39 in the year 1998. He also served an additional, as additional Solicitor General of India from 1998 to 2000 until he was appointed as a judge of the Bombay High Court. In 2013, he was appointed Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court and was elevated to the Supreme Court in 2016 and assumed office of the Chief Justice of India in November 2022. <coughs> Sorry. In Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachur, we see not only great scholastic achievements, but that are also coupled with humility and empathy. The Chief Justice is a fine blend of softness and firmness personified. I was fortunate in my early days in the Supreme Court of India to be a part of his bench the manner in which he handled the court those days and still now, while remaining most polite and calm, the ease with which he navigates through complex legal questions, the sincerity with which he upholds the fair name of justice, and the distinction with which he presides have been truly inspiring for me. Justice Chandrachud's tenure as a judge may be categorized by one monumental case after another on issues covering every ray of the spectrum. His judgments have played a critical role in embedding the ideals of privacy, decisional autonomy, and dignity through his judgments in Justice K.S. Puttaswamy and Navtej Johar. His judgment in Mohit Minerals has been hailed for strengthening the ideal of cooperative federalism. His lordship has materially championed the cause of substantive equality for women in public employment and within the private sphere through his judgments in Babita Punya, Colonel Mitisha and Joseph Shine. The opinions in Madhyamam Broadcasting and Indebri Creative have deepened the constitutional protection for free speech and expression, while his judgment in Patal Jamal Wali inaugurates the juristic development of the concept of intersectionality in Indian jurisprudence. 
Vikas Kumar and Avni Prakash give effect to the international and domestic obligations towards empowerment of the persons with disability. These outstanding accomplishments on the judicial side are matched by his far-sightedness in taking the Indian judiciary to the 21st century and beyond, and will be presiding over the celebration of 75th years of the Indian Supreme Court. Justice Chandrachud has led the work of the E-Committee of the Supreme Court, which include far-reaching improvements in the digital infrastructure in courts across the country. During his tenure, the ideal of access to justice has been amplified in all its dimensions. The Supreme Court has conducted an audit and produced a comprehensive report on the accessibility of its, of its premises for the elderly, pregnant women, and persons with disability, which is just one of the several reforms. The report was recently submitted by a committee headed by Justice Ravindra Bhatt. The employment of new artificial intelligence technology to break barriers of language in access to the judgments of the Supreme Court through the ESCR portal would go a long way in increasing the litigants' trust. The publication of the handbook on gender stereotypes would further deepen public trust by correcting pernicious anti-woman prejudice that continues to haunt the legal profession and women's quest for justice through the judicial process. Throughout his career as a judge, his lordship has created a progressive, liberal, inclusive ethos in the legal profession. He continues to leave his indelible stamp on the vital judicial organ and through that on our nation as a whole. <coughs> Sorry. It is no coincidence that Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Dr. D.Y. Chandrachur, has agreed to deliver this inaugural Sentinel Lecture. I would be remiss in not paying my tribute to Chief Justice Y.V. Chandrachur, for he opened the doors of the Supreme Court to judges of the Karnataka High Court by recommending the appointment of my father in January 1979. Earlier, Justice K.S. Hegde of the Mysore High Court was elevated from the Delhi High Court and there was no other judge from the Karnataka High Court in the Supreme Court. Coincidentally, it was on 18-12-1978, here in Bangalore, that Justice Y.V. Chandrachud expressed his intention to recommend Justice Venkatramaya as a judge of the Supreme Court of India. I may recollect that Justice Chandrachud, the present Chief Justice, came with his parents in December 1978, and I may also share with this audience that Justice D Chief Justice D.M. Chandrasekhar, I think, was not interested to go to the Supreme Court, and therefore the uh, choice fell on my father. On the occasion of the Golden Jubilee of the Karnataka High Court in the year 2006, Chief Justice Y.V. Chandrachud expressed his thoughts and sentiments on my father in a fine literary piece titled, Smiling Yet Serene Venkatramaya. And I quote a few lines from that piece. I regard it as a precious gift of destiny that a warm-hearted gentleman like ESV was one of my closest and finest friends. He was not only a good judge, but he was a good teacher of law. My analysis of ESV as a judge begins with a few preliminary observations. The Constitution spoke directly to him as a person, a judge, and an Indian citizen. He conceived of the Constitution as an embodiment of values that he believed in, and as a basis of granting him, as a judge, power to protect those values. He repeatedly emphasized that he had a duty under the Constitution to see that his understanding of the imperatives was implemented, and he saw the Constitution's imperatives as basically ethical in nature. Those imperatives that he read into the Constitution were so clear to him, and his duty to implement them so transparent that matters of doctrinal interpretation and of institutional power became nearly irrelevant to him. That is why his erudition was unspoken of and not perceptible to the passerby. The ethical imperatives that guided ESV as a judge reflected his personal morality in that he held a set of values that he believed represented moral truths about decent, civilized life. It was inconceivable to him that these values would not be embodied in constitutional principles, since he believed that they formed the essence of our democracy. In the now emerging public world of corruptible and self-serving persons, he set a standard of incorruptibility and humanity." Unquote. 
I will take only a few minutes to say how true those words are. Even before the coming into force of the Constitution on 26 January 1950, Justice Venkatramaya, as a young lawyer, had set up the Legal Aid Society in 1948. Access to justice, much before it gained institutional currency, was an article of faith for him. This principle manifested in his making a mark as a trial lawyer, known for his capacity to marshal facts, attention to detail, and clever cross-examination skills, coupled with his sound knowledge of legal doctrine. His arguments in the famous Drayta murder case, Drayta murder case in the late 1950s in the High Court, which was a legal aid brief, saved an innocent person from the gallows and won accolades for Venkatramaya. His motto as an advocate was intellectual honesty, personal morality, and eagerness to secure relief to the litigants as early as possible. In one of his addresses at the Bar Council of India function in Jaipur, Justice Venkatramaya paid tribute to the Bangalore Bar for supporting his professional growth, although he was not from Bangalore and a first-generation lawyer. He credited his colleagues at the Bar for imparting strength to his faltering steps. Perhaps in recognition of this support, he was the first to recognize the needs of a young lawyer and made sure to pay a stipend to his chamber colleagues every month, even at the risk of personal financial hardship, which was only transitory. I am informed that it was only rupees 100 those days, but quite a lot nowadays, I suppose. And I wish that tradition continues with the seniors vis-a-vis -vis their juniors. There are many judgments which are a window into his constitutional philosophy. I would like to highlight a few of them. In A.K. Subaya versus Chairman Karnataka Legislative Council, which was a petition instituted in public interest by two members of the state legislature, alleging that certain derogatory remarks were made on the floor of the House concerning the conduct of judges, Justice Venkatramaya, while dismissing the petition, wrote, and I quote, Was it not Voltaire who said like this, I do not agree with you, but I will fight for upholding your right to disagree with me till the end of my life. In the same spirit, this court, which has a special obligation to uphold the Constitution and the laws, upholds Article 194.2 of the Constitution and the immunity guaranteed to the members of the legislature thereunder, leaving it to them to uphold Article 211 of the Constitution in their deliberations. I am of the view that no action is called for in this case." Unquote. In this case, my father remembered uh, Chief Justice Subodh Ranjan Dasgupta, whom he considered to be an ideal. And he said, and he quoted what Justice Dasgupta said, that a judiciary which is, is one which consists of judges who are independent of themselves. The said words found resonance in the famous first judge's case, S.P. Gupta versus Union of India, in which he was the junior, junior most member of the seven judge bench presided over by Justice P. N. Bhagwati. His judgment comprised of 339 pages. Except for the extracts from correspondence and provisions, the rest of the judgment was personally handwritten by him. He ensured that his judgment was the first to be circulated to his senior brethren so that his views on the subject of appointment and transfer of judges were made known to them lest there should be any inroads into his thinking and convictions. I observed that it was his conviction, courage, and independence which in a way strengthened the Supreme Court as an institution as well as the judiciary. I have personally witnessed the unique journey of drafting that judgment, particularly in November 1981, and except for three days which interspersed during that writing, he had to take leave because my maternal grandfather died on 25th November 1981. He continued with the writing, and I may mention also, except for those three days, in his tenure of 10 years and nine months, he didn't take any leave on any other day. Deeply distressed, uh, and his judgment has been, uh, and he spoke about his ideas and thoughts which he reflected in his opinion. Deeply distressed by the extent of injustice and prejudice, caused to the petitioner on account of a special procedure. Justice Venkatramaya stated in the court, quote, if Article 14 was applicable to Anwar Ali Sarkar, why not to Abdul Rahman Antule, unquote, which culminated in a reference to a seven-judge bench to examine the extent to which special procedure prejudiced the accused or the petitioner therein. 
Sitting along with Justice Savisachi Mukherjee, the reference order consisting of 10 questions was heard by a seven-judge constitution bench headed by Justice Mukherjee, and by a 5 to 2 majority, the reference was answered in favor of A.R. Antule. Thank God, the doctrine of stare decisis does not apply to the Supreme Court of India, which enables a judge to question the correctness or otherwise of a larger bench decision. I remember my father in April 1988 when I had gone back for summer vacation from Bangalore to Delhi, sharing with me his fond hope to be vindicated, not as a personal vindication, but as one that would uphold the right to equality in its truest sense. He was indeed vindicated. I do not wish to prolong by speaking more about his judgments, except touch upon the fact that he was a votary for freedom of speech and expression, which are expressed in Indian Express newspapers, Bombay Private Limited. Being fond of the game of cricket, he was extremely unhappy and distressed that the BCCI had suspended six cricketers and Mr. Kian Buck, who is present here, he was the one who argued that matter. And he said in the open court, and I quote, get on with the game on the field and not in the court. This statement made the BCCI lift the suspension of the six cricketers. Many of the judicial officers present here would know that in Ishwar Chan Jain, Justice Venkatramaya ruled that the High Court must take steps to protect its honest judicial officers by ignoring ill-conceived or motivated complaints made by unscrupulous lawyers and litigants. My father was key, keenly interested in Sanskrit scholarship. In fact, those days the court opened at 11 a.m. and between 8.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. there was a Sanskrit teacher who came home to teach him Sanskrit. He not only seriously studied several famed Sanskrit works, English and Kannada literature, some of the works also find mention in his judgments particularly in the last paragraph of the first judge's case judgment. He had the unique distinction of being a judge of the Supreme Court longer than a judge of the High Court. Though he was a judge of the Supreme Court of India, the soil of Mandya always beckoned him. He never, he never forgot his roots. He remembered his village, his district, his state, as much as he did his people. In fact, during the last days when he couldn't speak, he wrote on pieces of paper, I am praying for Bharat. In short, Justice Vekatramaya was a scholar and a gentleman. He was a realized soul, for he believed work is worship and shared and sharing knowledge. And by sharing knowledge, one does not lose anything. My mother's world revolved around my father. She stood like a rock behind him, and she was known for her pragmatism and straightforwardness. With this, I thank each one of you for your kind attention. And I would now like to invite Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Dr. D. Y. Chandrachu, to speak on the topic, Constitutional Imperatives of the State, Navigating Discrimination in Public and Private Spaces. Thank you for your kind attention. Namaskar. Thank you.